الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Today we're going to have a reflection on the concept of the value of time in Islam from an Islamic perspective. And I'm sure that you all know the value of time, that it is precious. We hear this all the time. We hear it from our parents, we hear it from our teachers, we hear it from our colleagues. Our inner instinctive nature tells us and makes us feel depressed when we've got something to do, a duty, and we procrastinate and wait and delay it. We feel it in our anxieties, we feel it in our mental state. When we delay what is important and mix up our priorities in life, we put some things that are unimportant before the more important things. And our time and life is passing by very quick in the meantime. I remember when I was about 14 years old and I had an older friend. We were at the masjid in the mosque back in Lebanon. And he said to me a very simple statement. A very simple statement he said to me, that I went back home and asked my mum. He said, you know, 100 years from now, 100 years from now, not a single person that's living right now on the face of the earth will be alive. Let's say 120. 7 billion people will be wiped off the face of the earth in 100 to, 200 to 120 years? Yeah, if you think about it deeply, it's scary. So I went home and asked my mum and my dad, why am I even studying? Why am I even going to have to go to work? Why do I even have to get an education? Why do we even have to uh, do anything? Since we're all going to die anyway, What's the point? What's the point of getting married? All those questions. Everything in life now seems useless. No purpose. Since we're all going to die and leave it all behind, what's the point? But no. My parents taught me what the Quran says. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place us on this earth as a sporting game. That's exactly how it's mentioned in the Quran. As if Allah is just playing games with us. A'udhu Billah. You're talking about the Magnificent, the one whose knowledge and wisdom is infinite. The one who created you and me to think the way that we're thinking. He has created us in this world for a purpose. And after this world, there is another life. A person who is non-Muslim listening to this will say, this is absurd. But brothers and sisters, honestly inside of you, you feel it. You feel that you're not here for just purposelessness, just for nothing. Allah in the Quran tells us to look around us. He tells us to look at his creation and how it operates. He tells us to look at the sun and the moon, for example. The alternation of the day and the night. And he says, in this are signs for you if you only ponder and reflect properly. When you look around you, you see that everything in this universe is subjected to you. The sun rises and sets. Why? Just for the earth? For no reason? Because it decided to one day by accident? No. Allah says in the Quran that He brings the sun to us and keeps it at a distance to bring us and serve us with the nutrients and to serve us so that we may live our life subjected for us. It neither burns us nor leaves us to freeze to death. And from it we live on earth. The moon, Allah says, He subjected it to you. Allah says He subjected the animals to you. The human being is the most powerful thing on earth. No cow or goat or lion or dinosaur or tiger or insect or anything can overpower humanity 
humankind is the strongest being. Yet, we are not physically the strongest, but Allah has given us a mentality and a mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا He subjected everything in this world for you. So there has to be a reason why. And when you look at it, it has two things. What does it have? Purpose and what? And design. The sun, the moon, the earth, yourself. It has design. It has a design. And it has a purpose. When something has a design and a purpose, there must be an intelligent maker behind it. It necessitates that. So brothers and sisters, I can go on and on about the purpose of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in this world. And this is what I can tell you. In this world, Allah has given each and every one of us a time limit. Is this right or wrong? You have a time limit. Every single one of us does not know when that time will end. Am I right or wrong? You look at your ID and it says date of birth. Does anyone have an ID right now that says date of death? No. Every one of us has a time. And not one of us knows. Therefore, it is the most valuable thing we can spend. Time. Every one of us has 24 hours. Every one of us has the same time as everyone else. But unfortunately, some people look at time differently. You know, the physicist Einstein, he taught us something about what we call time is relative. Meaning it depends on how you look at it. Time differs from one person to another. It's true. If you look at time and don't value it, lots of time will pass by you and you don't care and it will pass quickly. There are those who value their time and utilize that time and they feel it. A little child doesn't care about time, it passes quickly. There are people who look at time as money. Time is money. The majority of people today, when you ask them what is time, they say time is money. Other people say time is my family. Some say time is myself, me, myself and I, that's it. Time is my health. Time is my enjoyment, some people say. Time is my uh, luxury and I just want to enjoy it the way I want to enjoy it. And everybody says we've got one short life to live, so make the most of it. Okay, how do you make the most of it? Let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. All of what I mentioned before is all temporary and meaningless. If you make your time money, then sorry. Even the greatest of philosophers and people of the past, even non-Muslims have all said, if your time is money, then your life is cheap. Why? What can money do for you? Yes, it can buy you, so, you know, it can pay for your bills and make you financially free. But it doesn't buy love, it doesn't buy your family, it doesn't buy you time. Can you buy more time in life with money? It doesn't really buy you the happiness, like real happiness, inner, inner happiness. It doesn't give you real purpose. You accumulate it and then leave it behind. You leave it behind. Some people make money their objective in life so much so that you'll see them for all their life until death, all their purpose is making another goal of how to accumulate more and more and more. In the meantime, they lose their marriage, they lose their children, they lose their relationships, they lose themselves and even their health. Many people like that spent their time after meaningless purposes. They make it me meaningful to themselves and as a result lo lost the most valuable people to them. There are billionaires who write about this and talk about this. Many of them say we die here on this deathbed alone with no, none of our children around us. They call us from time to time as if I don't exist, a mother and a father. Where is my spouse? Where is it, it, some, some of them, their, their wife is no longer with them or their husband. Some of them, their parents are not with them. Their children, they've lost them because of pursuit of money. And then they leave it behind and who takes it? Everyone else takes it. And they fight over it. And you and I go into our grave with a piece of cloth and we decay. Subhanallah. 
Now, in Islam, it doesn't say you don't pursue money. You should pursue your livelihood. But brothers and sisters, we need to prioritize what we do with our time. And we need to understand the purpose of why we're here and where we're going, number one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل نفس ذائقة الموت Every single person will taste death. We are inevitably going to die. All right. Why is Allah reminding us about death? Why am I reminding you about death? Because Allah wants us to take death as a motivator to utilize our time here wisely because it will end inevitably. Some people look at death as something negative. No, don't remind me of death because they just want to enjoy whatever they indulge in with no regrets. But Allah tells us, remember death so that you remember where you're going and how precious the time you have. To motivate you. You can take it either way. As Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu used to say, Kafa bil mawti wa'idha. Death is the best reminder. Reminder of what? Of why I'm here and where I'm going. In Islam, Allah teaches us, as in the Quran, that we are here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to experience things that are beautiful and lovely, such as love and mercy, forgiveness, working together, building relationships, producing things that benefit others, being a unity together on that which is good, commanding good and prohibiting evil, building up society for other people and yourself and the community. All of this is good. He gave us family, He gave us children so we can love them and they love us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, is the most merciful, the giver of mercy. He wants us to experience mercy ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wadud, He is close, He wants us to experience closeness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving, wants us to experience forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, the Almighty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us and wants to let us feel how being power, having power in this world feels and how making mistakes feels and so on and so forth. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us and hold us accountable for what we go through in this life. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. There is no other answer to this life except what the Quran has said, and that is, in this life you are living a time of a test. This life is a test, whether you like it or not. And everything around you shows you the same thing. I'll give you an example. If you're sitting in an exam room, You've got your teachers, your supervisors, you've got a chair, you've got a table, you've got the other students sitting there with you, you're probably at the front, the others at the back. It doesn't really matter what kind of chair or table, you might have a luxurious one, it doesn't really matter. You're given your rights and you're given a time. Do well in that exam and you will see the benefits and the reward afterwards. Waste your time in the exam and watch the consequences after the exam. This life as the Quran describes it is like an exam room. We are being tested for a short while and there are calamities that come to us back and forth. Allah tests us with different things that suit you and He knows that you are able to pass them if you put your mind to it and rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them are difficult, some of them are hard, but Allah assists. And so we are living in a time of a test. What will you do with your time? What will you do with your youth? What will you do with the spouse that you married? The children that Allah gave you? The health which He gave you? The wealth which He gave you? The clothing which He gave you? All the resources in the world which were given to you? What do you... Your parents, what, how will you treat them? Your neighbors, your education, yourself, all of that. The Prophet ﷺ told us in the hadith which is in a tirmidhi لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة On the Day of Judgment no one will move forward, even a step, until they are asked about their life and how they spent it, their youth and how they used it up, their health and how they used it, their wealth, where they got it from and what did they spend it on. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He warns us not to procrastinate. He says, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتَ فَيَقُولُ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْلَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَى أَجَلٍ لَوْلَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَى أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فأصدق فأصدق وأكن من الصالحين ولن يؤخر الله نفسا إذا جاء أجلها والله خبير بما تعملون سورة المنافقون verse 10 and 11 Allah said, and spend in the way of Allah from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you. And he says, my Lord, my Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be among the righteous. Allah replies by saying, but no, Allah will not delay a single soul or person when their appointed time has arrived. And Allah is well informed of all things that you do. Allah says in the Quran that on the day of judgment, our hands, our feet, our faces, our eyes, our ears, everything, that's what the verse is implying, will speak and witness to what we used to do. The Prophet said in a hadith which is collected in Bukhari, there are two blessings, two blessings which humans or most people take for granted. What are these two blessings? Your health and your free time. Your health and your free time. What do you do with them? There are people who spend their free time and their health majority of their day and night on social media flicking away and scrolling away some things are beneficial majority are not there are those who binge watch on Netflix all night until Fajr comes along I've even heard people say I do it so I can wake up for Fajr you see that's the shaitan destroying you and the shaitan said to Allah in the Quran, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will await for them on your straight path, meaning I will make them think they are doing a good deed for your sake while I'm destroying them from another angle. There are people who waste it on things that are forbidden, not only things that are worthless, but forbidden. Earning and accumulating what will be their demise in the hereafter. There are people who waste it on cutting off their ties with no good reason, having fights with their wife and their husband over senseless things, children fighting with their parents over silly things and personal desires. We fight with our parents, we fight with our children, we fight with people, we have road rages. For what? Anger, which by the way, scientists have established that anger is one of the causes that decrease a person's lifespan, highly likely to have a heart attack early. And you might say, well, we Muslims don't believe that person will die before their time. Yeah, Akhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created reasons for a person's lifespan as well. He, he coupled it. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that you're going to run a life where you're just going to fill it with anger and rage and aggression and just concentrating on stressing and looking into other people's business and lives and stressing yourself out of it, that will be a cause of your early death. It can be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, Most of your conversations which you have together, there is not much good in it. Except what is charitable. And dhikr, words of Allah. 
I will teach you, brothers and sisters, ways that when you come together, let's say you come with your friends and sit down on the table or you meet together anyway, it's not haram. But in our conversations, there are many things that are worthless and don't benefit us in anything. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that any group that we sit in, there is no good in it if Allah's name, meaning you don't remember Allah or His teachings in any way whatsoever. Nobody mentions it, nobody even mentions anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the Qur'an, about something of the hereafter, about something Prophet ﷺ said, about something which Islam has taught us, or practice something to remind each other of something good. They don't say any of that. He said that kind of gathering is cursed. The Prophet ﷺ taught us a dhikr word every time we sit in a gathering, what should we say? So brothers and sisters, if you ever are in a gathering and the talk is just worthless and senseless, just make sure to say this and memorize this dua. I'm going to say it, but you probably won't memorize it with me saying it. Grab a book called Fortress of the Muslim and you'll see it. The dua of leaving a, th a gathering. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Which means, my Lord, you are, you are free of any imperfection. My Lord, our Allah, and by your praise, I praise you in your praise. Uh, I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship but you. I seek your forgiveness and I return to you. After every gathering, Rasul said, if you say this dua meaningfully, it wipes away the minor sins which you spoke about and did during that gathering. Why is the Prophet teaching us that? Because he is so careful and fearful of our time being lost and wasted. My brothers and sisters, did you know that on the Day of Judgment, the Qur'an talks about the Day of Judgment. And it says that people will be so shocked at how time passed so quickly even the time that they were in their graves, when they were dead, they talk to each other because they feel that they hardly were on earth and they were hardly in their graves. Because when they get up, they see the world has changed. As Allah says in the Quran, On that day, the earth will be changed and the skies will be changed. It's not the same sky that you see, not the same earth. And the people, when we raise up, as Allah promised in the Quran and said, even those who deny it, it says, Oh yes, you will be raised up again. Don't think I put you on this earth for nothing. You will be raised up again, just like Allah raises life out of earth that is dead for a thousand years when the rain falls upon it. Just like you wake up after you go to sleep and you live again. Just like the way you were nothing, and then now you're something. It tells you that Allah, the one who puts you into this world, is able by all means to bring you back to life because it happened the first time. Before you were born, you were nothing. Now here you are. Look at you. are breathing. You're walking. How did that happen? Same way Allah says, we will return you back. The same way we, we began you the first time. Allah tells us in the Quran that on the day of judgment, the people will gather and each one will talk to the other. He says, for example, يَتَخَافَتُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا بِثْتُمْ إِلَّا عَشْرًا نَحْنُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ إِذْ يَقُولُ أَمْثَلُهُمْ طَرِيقَةً إِلَّا بِثْتُمْ إِلَّا يَوْمًا Allah says in chapter 20 verse 103, they shall whisper the people on Day of Judgment, they shall whisper among themselves. Why? Because they're frightened. You stayed on the earth. You stayed on the earth barely 10 days. That's what they say to each other. Allah mentions this in the Quran, that the people on Day of Judgment will say to each other, you barely stayed on earth 10 days. Now the word 10 days is not literal, but it's a feeling that they have. They go, what? Like, like it seems like 10 days. Allah says, we know well what they will say to one another. We also know that even the most cautious or cautious in his estimate will say, 
you lived in the world no more than a day. This whole world will feel like a day, brothers and sisters. In another passage in the Quran, in chapter 23, verse 112, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ عَدَدَ سِنِينَ قَالُوا لَبِثْنَا يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ فَاسْأَلِ الْعَادِّينَ قَالَ إِنْ لَبِثْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ فَتَعَالَى اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ الله says Then Allah will ask them on the Day of Judgment, For how many years did you stay on earth? They will say, We stayed for a day or part of a day. Ask of those who keep count of this, meaning ask the angels. He will say, You stayed only for a while, if you only knew that. Did you imagine, God says, Did you imagine that we created you without any purpose? And that you will not be brought back to us. So exalted Allah, the true King, there is no God but He, the Lord of the great throne. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, So exalted Allah, the great King, there is no God but He, the Lord of the great throne? It means Allah is above this that He should create you without any purpose. How could you think about Him? The exalted would just do stuff without a purpose. And that you may associate partners with him with impunity. You come and you say that other gods are better or you are better or you know better. And you say God is foolish. Allah said the exalted, the king of everything. You're calling him foolish. He will not create you for a foolish reason. My brothers and sisters, did you know that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Each one is a hostage to one's deeds. Save the people of the right hand who shall be in the gardens and shall ask about the guilty ones. What drove you to hell? The angels, they will meet the people who wasted their time on this earth and did not heed the day of judgment. And they lived it in disbelief and no other purpose but that, but their own desires and their whims. And when they meet on the day of judgment, knowingly, the angels will say, Ma salakakum fi saqar. What brought you to the punishment? قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينِ حَتَّى أَتَانَ الْيَقِينَ They will answer, we will not among those who observed our prayer and we did not feed the poor and we indulged in vain talk with those who indulged in vain talk and we gave the lie to the day of judgment we said it's all rubbish we don't believe in a day of judgment we're just here out of an accident we're just here just like that we're just bodies and feelings and that's it until the inevitable certainty caught up to us, until death came. Brothers and sisters, utilize that time so that on that day, we will not be regretful. There is a little story I want to share with you. The story is not from a hadith or from the Quran. And I don't know if it's an authentic, really, it did happen. But the moral of the story is amazing. Uh, my sheikh told me this once when I was a kid. And he says, look, there's this story, and the moral is important, about... Another sheikh, a righteous man, who saw a dream. And in this dream, he saw that he's running in the jungle. Have you heard this one? He's running in the jungle. And as he's running in the jungle, behind him there is a lion or a tiger that is chasing after him and ferociously wants to eat him. He says, I'm running in my dream and I wanted to escape from the tiger until I saw a well. So I jumped into the well. 
not thinking what's at the bottom, but just to escape the tiger. He goes, as I jumped into the well in my dream, I grabbed onto a rope that was hanging and I held onto this rope with all my life. The tiger walked away and I could hear its roar fading away. He says, I felt safe. But then suddenly, after a little while, I saw beneath me in the well an anaconda, big snake coming up towards me, about to devour me. So I started climbing upwards. But as I was climbing upwards on the rope, I saw right at the top two mice, one white and one black. And each one of them is nibbling away at the edge top of the rope. If I don't make it in time, the rope will snap and the anaconda will devour me. So I couldn't make it in time. Instead, I started shaking the rope, he says in his dream, trying to shake the mice off. But he couldn't. As he was shaking it, he started swerving from side to side, hitting the sides of the well. He said, I felt something sticky on the walls. Because as I looked at the stickiness, some of it went into my mouth and I realized it was honey. Sweet, beautiful, indulging honey in my dream. It tasted amazing. He said, the honey was so sweet that I got busy licking the honey and I forgot about the anaconda and the mice that were eating away at my rope until I woke up. As I told you, this is, we don't know if the story is true, but the moral is what we're after. So he went to his sheikh and the sheikh said to him the interpretation of this dream. He said, what is this dream? What is it? He says, it's simple. If you want to interpret it my way, I'll tell you. That tiger that you are running from in your dream is a symbol of the angel of death. You can run away all you like in this life. Do whatever you want. Travel the world. Go on holidays. Go as far as you want. Go to the moon and back. But the angel of death will inevitably catch up to you. Death, you will never escape it. He says, okay. Then what is the well? He said, the well is your grave that is awaiting you. He said, what is the rope? He said, the rope is the life that you have before you fall into the grave. That's your life. He said, what is the anaconda? He said, if you don't fix up your life, that's the consequence of what you're going to in the hereafter. He said, what are the mice? What are the mice? He said, the mice is a symbol of the day and the night. Every day that passes, every night that passes is eating away from your life. Subhanallah. Wallahi, the, the meaning is true and it's supported by the Quran and Sunnah. He says, Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh, what is the honey? What is the honey? He said, Ah, the sweet honey. The sweet honey is the indulgence of this world. You got yourself too busy with the false indulgence of this world that you forgot that there is an angel of death coming. Death is waiting. A grave is waiting. A hereafter is coming. And that your life is ending every day and you are heedless of it. Subhanallah. The meaning is true. The meaning is true. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, says, I do not regret more than when the sun sets in a day and I go to sleep and I cannot count enough of extra good things that I have produced that day. He has to go to sleep knowing that he has produced good things that day. Otherwise, he has lost that day forever. My brothers and sisters, time waits for no one. Time is the beginning and the end, meaning it's not renewable. It's what you get and what ends. You can never get it back. Time will tell the truth. In time, everything is revealed, if not here and hereafter. Time is the equalizer. Everybody is equal before time. Nobody can buy extra time. Nobody can delay or bring it forward. Time is what you have. And the most precious thing you can give is your time. But at the same time, you must hold on to it and use it in the best way. What is the best way? As the poet says, لا دار للمرء بعد الموت يسكنها إلا التي كان قبل الموت يبنيها 
فإن بناها بشر بخير طاب مسكنه وإن بناها بشر خاب بانيها There is nothing awaiting you as a home except the home which you are building now now you're building it the one that you were building before your death if you build it with goodness in this life then you will enjoy it forever and whoever builds it with evil in this life is the true loser you know brothers and sisters there are people who live for good reasons they live for their family they live for their children they live for their job in order to survive and not need others they live for worthy causes like a charity they build orphanages they live to uphold justice they live to build society and make it a better place for other people there are people who use their skills to benefit others and themselves and to build love and unity and peace between people there are so many great purposes which people do live by brothers and sisters i am not ignoring that nor denying that muslim and non-muslim there are many people who live for amazing purposes in life and we see them mashallah amazing lives that they live very purposeful and very meaningful and that's excellent but brothers and sisters you got to ask yourself questions and then what after all of this goodness that i lived for did i live it just for here or is there anything after here what is there after that just death and leave it behind knowing that i've left a good legacy okay beautiful but the years go on and thousands of years go on and you'll be forgotten and everything is forgotten isn't there something greater than that is that it is that what life is that's it no no way allah tells us this life is a short time a transition from here and then there will be another life we as muslims learn to make this life now purposeful and also make it purposeful for our hereafter so that when you earn money you earn it in a way that is permissible and halal why because your intention is that you want allah when he judges you on the day of judgment you are comfortable to say my lord i earned my wealth in the way that pleases you and that is with goodness and justice you want to spend your money no problem but spend it in the way that is halal why because you want to avoid the haram so on a day of judgment you say my lord i spent it in the way that you allowed me you might say well that's my money ah you cannot get the money without allah's resources brothers and sisters your brain that god gave you if he didn't give it to you you cannot work and how to make money the hands the eyes the mouth the legs the resources they're all from allah you wouldn't get it without him so that if you have a purpose in life you look after orphans you look after your parents you look after your children you look after your spouse you look after your health you look after your enjoyment you make meaning for in this life which is relationships with your family relationships with your children love and goodness seeing your children grow up healthy nurtured righteous good for this world and then you leave it and pass away as a legacy not only in this world do you leave a legacy but something for your hereafter inshallah that will also build your hereafter don't think that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he lets go of a tiny atom's worth of goodness that you do allah says in the quran Allah says and whatever goodness you put forth even an atom's worth in this world anything that you put in goodness in this world is for yourself and Allah will reward you greater than anyone else Allah has the best reward for you brothers and sisters you know you go home you see that wife of yours you see that husband of yours and for the sake of Allah you smile to them anybody can do that that smile for the sake of Allah gets you rewarded from Allah for doing goodness because he loves it he loves the fact that you're getting closer and number two it creates peace in the house and it creates love and closeness inshallah for most people so long as the, the smile is genuine you go Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a piece of food that because of you enters into your spouse's mouth or your children's mouth is a sadaqah it's a form of good deed and charity 
The Prophet sallallahu said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيء Don't take for granted, don't belittle any kind of small deed. Every tiny deed that comes your way, don't belittle it, do it. He said, even if you move a harmful object off a public road, or somewhere where you know someone may step on it or slip on it or have to move around it or just for the sake of Allah you do that you see a, a colony of ants yeah I'm gonna make you something so simple I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what every single one of you can do even these little children over here you see a colony of ants in a park in your backyard and you have the option of stepping on it but for the sake of Allah you leave them that is rewarding. You've spent your time wisely. You go out to work for the purpose of being independent so that you don't beg and ask people and so that your family can become independent of financial needs while you sweat and go from day and night thinking that you're wasting your time. You are not. For the sake of Allah, you are working for something called Iffa. Iffa, which means to not need others. And to, be, and to have self-respect. Rasul used to always call for iffa. And he used to call for afia. Afia. Afia, which means to be uh, healthy and not in need and so on. You remember the hadith of Rasul which is in Bukhari, when they saw a man walking and he was striving and he had a strong body. And they said, if only he used that strong body, fi sabilillah. In the path of Allah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, turned around. And he, what they mean by path of Allah, meaning in, in battle. You've got to go fight and kill in battle the enemy. And that's, that's fi sabilillah. The Prophet ﷺ corrected them. He said, no. If that man is going and striving in order to feed a family and children which are dependent on him, then it is in the path of Allah. If he is going to work so that he can look after an old elderly parents who need him. It is in the path of Allah. If he is going to work so that he can get married and find a wife, so that he can have a family or have a wife for himself, it is in the path of Allah. The path of Allah are many, many, many brothers and sisters. And what you need to do, brothers and sisters, is not, is not over, don't do israf. What is israf? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Wallahu la yuhibbul musrifeen. Allah does not like those who do israf. And in another verse Allah says, Wala tubadhir tabdhira inna al mubadhirina kanu ikhwan al shayateen. Do not be wasteful. The people who waste are the friends or the brethren of the shaytan. What does it mean? Israf and tabdhir both mean waste. But tabdhir is to spend your time, your wealth, and your energy on things that are haram, that are forbidden. Israf means you spend it on things that are permissible. But things you cannot afford. You cannot afford them. Meaning, what does afford mean? Let me explain to you. If you're married, for example, your wife has a right upon you financially as a husband. If you have children, your children have a right upon you financially. If you are a mother, you have time that you need to put aside for your children as well. And same as your husband for your husband. If you have parents, you have little time to give to them as well. You have your health and your body. You have time for your health and your body. You need a car. You need to get to work. You need to do other things, food and so on and so forth. If you start spending in one area too much, whereby, whereby it's going to cause you to neglect another duty, then that thing you did right there is called israf. So it's relative. There are people who are very wealthy, they're rich in money. They can spend more than you and I on more expensive things, no problem, because they can afford it and they can still fulfill their duties perfectly. That's not called israf. But people who cannot afford everything, you have to manage your wealth and manage your time and your resources. Allah says He does not like those who do things they cannot afford because you are wasting resources, time and wealth and you were putting yourself in a big problem. As Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبِسُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا Do not be too stingy, putting your hands close to you. No, 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 I'm not going to spend. And do not open up, up all wide, spending on everything. But be balanced, otherwise 
you will sit there regretful and powerless in trouble. So Islam is about managing your time and making your time meaningful and purposeful. How many people I know ran after money and only money making it their purpose and their children left them to rot and don't want them? How many people their pursuit in life was only for themselves and at that expense they lost their husband or their wife and their family? How many people have lost the precious things around them in the pursuit of things that are not very meaningful? So my brothers and sisters, a Muslim is balanced in everything and time is precious to him or her. The biggest lie that I've ever heard from someone is to say, I do not have time. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time for my parents. I don't have time for my spouse. I don't have time for my children. I don't have time for my friends or for my uh, work or whatever it is. It's not that you don't have time, brothers and sisters. You do. You have to prioritize your time. What is more important? What is more important? Psychologists and philosophers got it right. They said humans tend to make excuses that they have no time because they fear the guilt of accountability for making choices. If you make a choice, it's on you. So you say, I don't have time, so you don't feel guilty. So you don't feel guilty. So it's reassuring to convince yourself, I have no time, by lying to yourself. When it comes to time, we can either make excuses, as one speaker said, and I really, that really stuck with me, or you can make sacrifices, my dear brothers and sisters. Do you know how love and meaningful life comes? Through sacrifices, not through excuses, through sacrifices. And here are four things that you should do to get your time right. Number one, prioritize. Prioritize first what is pleasing to Allah, what Allah told you to prioritize. And secondly, you can tell what is more important than others. Number two, give what you prioritize each an amount of time. Don't use all the time in the world for it. Each one, specify a time and finish and move on. Number three, discipline. You need to be disciplined, brothers and sisters. The worst thing we can hear from anybody, and I hear it as a teacher from students, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're still learning, they're growing, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them successful and get them out of this habit. Even adults say this. When it comes to doing things, they wait for some motivation of some sort. They say, I'm not motivated. I need a feeling. I don't feel motivated. Brothers and sisters, nothing in this world comes through motivation. It comes now and then. But you can't rely on your life doing things based on you wait until uh, somehow you get this motivational speech and then you feel pumped. Uh, two hours later, you're back where you were. Or that little bit of coffee they take or that V-bottle that you take or whatever it is. This doesn't give you the motivation. You need to be disciplined. You need to say to yourself, be quiet. Get up and do what needs to be done. And watch how you feel proud of yourself. And number four, utilize every activity by including something pleasing to Allah. Every activity you do, use it and utilize it in a way that is pleasing to Allah. For example, you want to eat, make a time for your eating. That is a priority. Say Bismillah. Say Bismillah. And eat halal. And say Alhamdulillah when you finish. And if you can, eat with your right hand. Because eating with your right hand is a sunnah recommended. Eating with your left is disliked. So go for what is recommended. A priority to look after your parents, go ahead and say, Oh Allah, accept my good deeds, turn it into worship, and so on. And lastly, brothers and sisters, here are the actions to make time for and prioritize specifically. Number one, salat and the other four pillars of Islam. Your five daily prayers and the other four pillars of Islam. Number two, people you are responsible for, your children, your spouse and your parents. Number three, yourself, your health, your well-being, your sleep, your hobbies, your enjoyment and halal entertainment, halal entertainment to re-energize yourself. Remember when I gave you the example of binge watching? 
halal entertainment, if you watch something that's halal, which is not really too many out there, but if you do have an entertaining halal thing, sports or whatever you do, uh, the list goes on. Don't do it forever. Make a time for it, just enough to re-energize yourself. Once you start feeling that you're feeling lethargic and it's meaning, meaningless, move on. You've got to do something different. Number four, your promises and your agreements. So your honesty in work and your contracts and promises you make. This needs to be a priority in the management of your time. And if, for example, if you work, for example, nine to five, you have a contract. It says to you, leave at five. Don't leave at four or 4.30, leave at five. Stick to your contracts, for example. Whatever promises you made, fulfill them. Don't try to cut corners. Number five, your sustenance and livelihood and income. Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَى نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Do not forget your share of this world. Seek it by means of the wealth that Allah has granted you, the abode of the hereafter, Allah says. But forget not your share in this world and do good as Allah has been good to you. And do not strive to create mischief in the land, for Allah loves not those who create mischief. Allah is good to you by giving you choices, by giving you the stuff that you have, only we turn it bad. Number six, learning and seeking knowledge. Deen first. Dunya second. That serves your purpose in life. Some people, they say to me, what's geography going to do for me? What's humanity going to do for me? What's science going to do for me? What's math going to do for me? I say, learn all of this you get rewarded for if you use it to help the community and others for the sake of Allah. Knowledge is power. And don't ever take for granted knowledge. Number seven, voluntary worship. Include a combination of sunnas, night prayer, dua, prayer for thankfulness, extra services for someone just extra services for someone just to be thankful to Allah. All these little things that you do. Number eight, connecting your family ties. Make a time to connect to someone you haven't spoke to in a long time among your family. A phone call, a message, a visit if you can. Number nine, helping others. Community service, charity, check on your neighbors. You know, on Eid, there are some people, they go to their neighbors and take ma'mul. It's Lebanese, Arab culture. And you know what? There are some of them used to talk about Muslims and Islam tremendously and it created a bond. At least if they didn't become Muslim, they think of Muslims in a different way. And at the end of the day, you do it for the sake of Allah, not just to convert people. Number one, it is you and your deeds which are going to matter to you. And Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas alaykum anfusakum la yadurrukum man dalla idha hadaytun. O people, at the end of the day, you are to be concerned about your development and yourself. Those who are misguided cannot harm you if you are guided. Be charitable to people, brothers and sisters, and even to animals or anything. And lastly, Quran reciting and dhikr. And I'll just put it last just as a number, but this can be uh, in the beginning. Throughout your day and throughout your night, brothers and sisters, this is a sunnah which has been forgotten by a lot of people. When you wake up, there is a dua you say. When you go to sleep, when you exit your home, when you come into your house, when you wear your clothes, when you take off your clothes, when you go to the bathroom, when you eat, when you drink, when you're scared, when the moon comes out, when the sun comes out, when you go to learn, when you go to work, everything has a beautiful dhikr and a dua. It takes you three seconds to say them. And after your salat and so on. Brothers and sisters, these 10 things should be part of your priority list, which you manage and put somewhere in your life. <clears throat> Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about repentance. Not everything is lost and gone. If you have wasted part of your life and you have gone to this age now, then remember, you can always fix it in two ways. By fixing what is left of your life in goodness and making up for it. And Allah will reward you up to 70 to 1,000 to more faults. And repent. If there are major sins still in your life, which you have not abandoned or you have done in the past, then remember to repent to Allah. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ 
وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Surah Al-Amran verse 135, Allah says, And those who when they do a heinous and dirty act, or they wrong themselves by doing indecent and sinful acts, they remember Allah. They remember Allah afterwards. And then they ask Allah to forgive them from their hearts for what they had done of sins. And they think to themselves, and who else? Or Allah says, and who else is the one to forgive sins except Allah? Allah is the one that forgives sins on one condition. So long as they do not insist to persist on what they are doing while they know that it's wrong. What does it mean to insist, to persist? It means that they delay their repentance. They wait and wait and wait and say, Insha'Allah when I go to Hajj. Insha'Allah when I'm 50. Insha'Allah if I'm 15 until I'm 30. Insha'Allah when I get married. Insha'Allah. No. Repent quickly. Even if later on you got weak and fell into the same problem, repent quickly. But don't be like the brothers of Yusuf السلام, where they said kill him or throw him in a barren land and afterwards ask God to forgive you. God, Allah, cannot be tricked. So at the time, be sincere. Even if you had thought like that and you made a plot and a plan, Allah will still forgive you if at the time that you repent you are really sincere. But don't wait brothers and sisters. Tomorrow we don't know where you and I will be. Next week you and I don't know if we'll still be alive. For the call is always there. Let us make our lives meaningful. Let us use our precious time wisely. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us on this difficult journey and forgive our shortcomings. Ameen. Hada wa sallallahu wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Introducing the One Islam TV app. The ultimate destination to learn about Islam with hundreds of educational videos, lessons, and documentaries. Experience our YouTube channels in one place. All content is music free. Download the One Islam TV app now from the Apple or Google Play Store today. Mm -hmm.